Hello, everyone. Please come in and find a seat. It's crowded. I can, I can spot a few seats over here if you... There are two empty seats up here if you're looking. So, um, thank you all for coming. Can we swap to the program? My name is uh, Christian Ulrik Andersen, and I'll um, moderate this first part of um, the Research Network session. Uh, but first of all, I want to say thank you to a couple of people, uh, in particular Christopher Gansing, uh, for making this uh, possible for us, but also his um, staff here, and in particular Emily and Lane, I don't know if they're here, but thank you so much to you, and also thank you to the Canadian Embassy wh with whom we have uh, been collaborating uh, this year. So before we dive into the presentations, I'd like to say a little bit about the workshop or the format of these research uh, Net or research workshops that we've been doing for quite some years with the, in partnership with Transmediale. So it's a collaboration between Aarhus University in Denmark and Transmediale Festival. And each year we have a, a shifting partner. So this, a new partner, a new institution, a university, a cultural institution. And this year it's been GemLab a global emergent media lab in, uh, at Concordia University in Montreal and Center for the Study of the Network Image at London South Bank University in London. Um, so um, what happens in these research workshops is that we put out a call, usually in the summer, late summer, that people respond to and we have many responses and maybe some of you have applied but not been admitted. So. Unfortunately, we can't uh, let everyone in, but we get many, many, many really good, um, mostly PhD students, but also artists, researchers applying for these uh, workshops. Um, and about 15 participate in a journey. First, there's an online discussion of uh, their research. This year, we, we've been running a, a mailing list. Um, and from that on, we move into a physical workshop. This year we've been meeting two days at the Canadian Embassy here in Berlin this week. And out of that comes these presentations that you're all going to listen to and see uh, now. Then, on top of that, each year we also produce a newspaper. Though it doesn't really look like a newspaper, it is technically a newspaper. Uh, so this is also the launch of this this year, it's uh, the output of the mailing list, and it's going to be available after uh, these presentations for you to pick up here at the stage. Continuing this, all uh, the participants will also be invited to submit their um, uh, research to the online journal, a peer-reviewed journal about, and then it's the ever-shifting theme of uh, Transmediale addressed as research. So this year it's going to be a peer-reviewed journal about uh, research networks. So um, that's going to come out uh, before, just before the, the summer, we uh, imagine. So um, the, 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 the form of the presentations, uh, just to say a little bit about this, um, there'll be mini panels, four panels, where each panel participant will have five minutes to present his or her research. Uh, and then after that, there'll be an open discussion where we invite you to participate. So these four mini panels will run through the next uh, three hours or so. And uh, the panels reflect what has happened in the workshop. So we'll be picking up on themes that have occurred in the discussion between the participants. So I won't say much uh, more about the, um, the content of uh, these streams. I think it will be self-evident, and it's pretty small up here, but I'm sure you'll figure out what the themes are as we go along. So having said this, uh, welcome everyone, and I'd like the first panel to come to the stage.
Yeah, so as uh, our panelists uh, um, get themselves organized and sat at the table, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, our speakers today in the first panel. As uh, Christian mentioned, we have um, uh, quite a, um, a series of, of talks, uh, five minutes each. Um, and that will take place one after another, and after that we'll open, um, we'll open uh, the floor to, the, to questions. Um, I'd like to um, first introduce Ke Wong Kai Lee, who's an artist researcher uh, based in Hong Kong, and he's currently also assistant professor in photography and program director of BA uh, in visual arts at the Academy of Visual Arts in Hong Kong. He's also a curatorial member of uh, 1A Space and Independent um, Art Space in Hong Kong. Our next speaker is um, Osgun Elul Ishen, and she's currently a PhD candidate in uh, the program of Computational Media and Arts uh, and Cultures at Duke University. Um, and after that, we have uh, Juan Pablo Pacheco, who is an artist uh, and researcher with an MFA from San Francisco uh, Art Institute, um, researching uh, and reflecting on the relationship between digital technologies and political, ecological, and social systems. And our final uh, speaker today is uh, Sudipto Basu, who is a PhD researcher um, and student in cinema studies um, at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi, uh, studying the feedbacks between histories of the moving image. Um, and this panel is entitled, um, you might not see that from far away, but it's in, entitled Network in Exclusions, Borders, Edges and Surrounds, and came out of uh, conversations and presentations that we had over the last two days. And uh, I'd like to invite you now to, to give your five minute presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Magda. So, um, the internal networks was conceived in 1968, a year of worldwide civil protests. The context of my paper is situated in 2019 New China, another year of political oppression and civil disobedience in a global scale. The term New China is defined by ideas such as nationalhood, nationalism, economic protectionism, political hegemony, information and algorithm ideological control. The influence of New China's network culture may demonstrate how unavailable network distinguish an unavailable network culture and bring concepts and questions of protectionism, censorship, transgression, resistance through online and offline networks. The Great Firewall of China is a geopolitical, infrastructural and informational tool to understand cyber protectionism in China a gateway of network that was first started in operation since 1998 and being considered as an alternative model and a parallel universe of the internet. The Great Firewall of China is a war, a shade, a sword, and a war in itself. As a closed national network system itself and operate in parallel to the internet, um, this model demonstrates, be it distressing or deliberating, a decentralized and autonomous network model also, the Great Firewall is not the only national network. For example, North Korea operates the Kwangmin Network, a national internet that it can be accessed outside North Korea. The Great Firewall, uh, Kwangmin internet, the deep web, the dark web, all these question the assumption and integration of interconnectedness of one widely available network, as the internet is the only, uh, uh, is the only tip of an iceberg. Feijun's interactive installation in Interesting World at the China Pavilion at the Venice Biennale 2019 exhibit the performativity of the network culture and the new China, a lens media projection of presumably offline and false face recognition technology. The installation brings visitors to a simulate image surveillance environment that is pervasive in contemporary China. It is assumed that more than 200 million surveillance cameras have been installed in China to support mass surveillance and the social credit system. Postulate Feijun's work as an image surveillance environment. It could be explained in two conceptual layers, through identification and through experiencing the system. I was identified as a dancing master because of my body movement, even though I don't know how to dance at all. Two other dancing masters were identified simultaneously, more identification through a set of color coding system. The identification was constant operation, mutation, and ever shifting. 
A moment afterwards, more categories were identified. Questions are raised. Is it a functional and activate face recognition system? Is it a live recording for image data mining? What was the database of the prescribed identity and category? Are we, the visitor, being watched, data mine, analyzed, and archived? Or, my question would be, is it just an offline facade to demonstrate China's world power in image, imaging technology, artificial intelligence, and state surveillance in a major world exposition? We stand in front of and experience the two sides of image technology, the capturing and the analytic. The experience is a choreographed artificial intelligence to demonstrate China's place in world power relations. And at the back end of the work, perhaps there's no database, no network, and network unavailable. The final case study extends to the everyday life, the Hong Kong protests, and the flow of information. In the past seven months, protests to communicate via P2P network to avoid surveillance from the authority and try to reach those, for example, senior citizen who has a smartphone. Internet meme of critique to the government and China is sensual airdrop that iPhone user can choose to accept in public sphere. Android user, however, is excluded uh, from the alternative network. For many occasions, the BBS platform in Hong Kong was DDoS attack live stream video by citizen photojournalists are broadcast via social media platform. However, with a great amount of reaction by viewers such as like, love, angry, the video experience time lag because of information overloading. Viewers' reaction ultimately become the burden of bandwidth. The overload bandwidth situation is not unusual at the protest site. With a mass amount of data traffic by protester, the public Wi-Fi and the network per se are overloaded and not to be able to function. What we Hong Kong protesters experienced in the past seven months are on both edge of the internet, that an offline network brings and connect, and an online network that cannot be functioned as we expect. Finally, the Great Firewall, interesting world, and airdrop suggest a new China's model of unavailable network that seems distant and yet happening. If China is or was the future, dare I ask, would this model otherwise have potential to influence post-globalized information structure? Will network unavailable, state authority, and protectionism be an inevitable network future? Thank you. Hello. Um, my project uh, historicizes computational media in the context of the Middle East as infrastructures of imperial and neoliberal practices at large. The systems produced and maintained by computational technologies, including from military to financial systems, cannot be taught in isolation from the ongoing investments in war, oil, energy, security, real estate, arts, and high-tech industry, taking place in the region all at once. Therefore, I frame my focus on the Middle East as a necessity to examine the current operations of capital and computational media in a global context. As you can see in the sequence um, here, Dubai's smart future is presented as a peaceful and sustainable place with polished images, in a heavy contrast to the present urban lives found throughout the rest of the Middle East, where unruly, violent and chaotic scenes play out on city streets. This contrast underscores two sides of the same coin, marked by the economic and political dominance of the Arabian Gulf countries and U.S. imperialism at large. In this regard, I examine how digital and networked media facilitate political encounters and resonances within and across various urban contexts, especially across the global South-North divide. To this end, I draw upon Frederick Jameson's notion of cognitive mapping, a process through which individuals render their places in a capitalist world system and its historicity intelligible. Cognitive mapping acts as a model for how we might begin to articulate the relationship between the local and global scales. Diverging from content 
or platform fetishism, as Jonathan Beller argues, we need to look at the geopolitical implementations of these media formations, which are inseparable from the history and present of coloniality. We must attend to the surround. In a dialogue with Sandra Mezatras and Brett Nielsen's emphasis on the politics of operations, I would interpret the surround as the sites of extraction, exchange, and expenditure. To this end, I write about artistic practices that connects the incident of capitals hitting the ground to the spatial, temporal, and discursive continuities through which global capital as well as media systems operate today. Today, I will very briefly talk about the Lebanese artist Bassem Saad's interactive online game-like work titled Cared For by Chains and Loops, which sheds light upon the uneven relations of labor, care, and waste that are materialized within the urban setting of Beirut, Lebanon. The dwelling space captured and redesigned by 3D imaging technologies is that of a paranoid queer narrator who is convinced about the presence of a localized emergent intelligence which initiates infrastructural projects that are detrimental to biological health. In the face of slow violence in Rob Nixon's terms and unreliable mechanisms of neoliberal state, the character carries out specific life-preserving rituals. Saad's work becomes an act of cognitive mapping as it maps out a global chain of care that is not only north to south, but also south to south. On one hand, the spreading toxicity in Beirut in the absence of required public services contributes to the need for private health care, including domestic care provided by migrant workers arriving from Africa and Asia. <coughs> On the other end, the glowing city islands of Dubai, such as Healthcare City, underlines the growing popularity of health tourism in Dubai, which again prey on the cheap labor provided by migrant workers in the sectors of service and construction. Saad's virtual scenery of Beirut contests the ideal of smart city, smart mandate in Orit Halpern's terms, in the face of recurring crises of capitalism, whether financial or ecological. According to Shannon Mathern, the cybernetic image of a city reifies information by obscuring the ways in which urban information is made, commodified, accessed, and politicized. We need to shift our gaze by looking at how data is distributed within a varied ecology of urban sites and subjects who in interact with it in multiple and usually conflicting ways. Therefore, there is an urgent need for contra-visual practices in Nicolas Mirzov's terms to contest the regime of visuality through which neoliberal state legitimizes its own myths and violent actions. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so today I would like to explore the relationship between hunting and information networks as digital hunting becomes an essential practice of territorial control. My artistic and academic research has revolved around the entanglements of digital and material worlds and the forces that shape these connections, creating what I refer to as techno-territories, hybrid spaces that lie within the intersection of natural and technical networks. In the 1970s, uh, Susan Sontag and Willem Flusser traced the relationships between photography and hunting. As the act of shooting was superseded by the act of looking, photographic images turned into effective means of controlling the mobility of human and non-human bodies. What I argue, however, is that contemporary informational networks sharpen the operational relationship between digital images and the hunting of undesired bodies across contested territories. Between 2011 and 2014, Joanna Moll, a Spanish-based artist, developed a net-based project based on six online surveillance cameras placed by landowners at the US-Mexico border in Arizona. Triggered by a motion sensor, the cameras captured the movement of human and non-human agents through these image sequences that were automatically uploaded to an open website. 
Users could report suspicious activity to the border authorities through clicking a button, becoming digital police officers offering free labor. This piece, Arizona Move and Get Shot, consists of six videos made by an algorithm which automatically took all the images uploaded to the surveillance website throughout four years. Those of us who actively navigate the internet have become digital hunters in constant search for images. However, the crowdsourced surveillance systems tapped by Joanna Mo's work unveil the creation of more sophisticated digital hunters who are able to curtail the mobility of undesired immigrants. Human hunting has been a common practice in colonial and law enforcement systems, from lynching to bounty hunters and cowboy huntings of indigenous people in the Americas, human hunting has been a common practice in these uh, power systems. The latest technological advances have perfected this practice of hunting down human and non-human undesired bodies, both for leisure and as a form of territorial control. Susan Sontag claims that, quote, there is something predatory in the act of taking a picture. To photograph people is to violate them by seeing them as they never see themselves, by having knowledge of them they can never have. It turns people into objects that can be symbolically possessed." Unquote. This operational dimension of image-making technologies is exacerbated in the age of computational surveillance, where being photographed threatens the very existence of the image's subject. The networked surveillance system at the US-Mexico border reverts the camera back to its fundamental function, to freeze life through shooting the desired subject, in this case, quite literally. Even though the main purpose of these cameras is to turn users into immigrant hunters, the images don't show much human activity. Instead, they mostly capture the non-human life that inhabits the borderlands. In fact, the company that provides the cameras used to surveil the border is also a big provider for the animal hunting industry. The same technology used to hunt animals for, for sport is used to hunt immigrants crossing the border. These architectures of vision create the networks where digital hunters become territorial subjects of power. Mostly composed of low angles, these images' points of view, point of view is akin to that of a camouflage predator waiting to catch its prey. Digital hunters are not the operators of these photographic apparatuses, which are automated by a sensor, but the consumers of these images on the other side of the screen, miles away from their field of vision. In the age of networked surveillance, watching and hunting become convoluted into the same process of territorial control, as the border becomes an interactive interface. The work of Joanna Moll reveals the US-Mexico borderland as a complex techno-territorial system composed of intersecting layers of natural, technological, and socio-political flows. My own, throughout my uh, most recent speculative artistic research, I am also exploring the relationship between the internet's physical infrastructure and hunting. The underwater fiber optic cables that connect the internet servers worldwide move digital goods through very similar routes to the ones used by large container ships, which move the vast majority of the global economy's products. Both infrastructures have become crucial in order to sustain relations of power through the control over the flow of bodies, organisms, minerals, and information. Many of these routes were also charted during, during a pre-electrical era, where the light that extended the day into the night came from kerosene lamps, typically fueled by whale oil. The whaling industry was a sort of proto-electrical power grid for the fast-growing European colonial powers, and the hunting routes that it was based upon were deeply connected to the migration routes of whales. The connection between submarine cables, global trading routes, and whale migration routes comes to light as I continue exploring the deep connection between whale hunting and transoceanic infrastructures. Um, in conclusion, territories are possibilities instead of givens, as Deleuze and Guattari had already pointed out, mediated by biological and technological processes. Even though the Earth is already a networked, always already a networked territory, the material and technological infrastructures of the Internet and its feedback loops with global structures of power allows us to identify the emergence of new territorial, biopolitical, and ecological orders. 
Digital hunting opens up an analytical window into, into the convoluted histories and practices around global networks. Thank you. Hello. So I'd like to begin by thanking Transmediale for having me over to my comrades at the workshop for the learning experience and you, the audience, for being here today. In a world order where planetary scale computational networks have restructured our many spheres of existence, what has already not been connected to the network lies in wait merely as standing reserve. As capital searches for new sources of value, its networks look for new outsides to subsume. To cap off the discussion on the outsides, edges, and broader circuits or surrounds of the global network, I therefore ask, might we think of the ends of the network as frontiers of extraction? While capitalism is, is usually seen as homogenizing, Anna Singh, Sandro Mezzadra, and Brett Nielsen argue that it also multiplies borders and differences. Capital's big picture is made up of a, uh, of a teeming heterogeneity. Its abstract machine feeds on friction, both social and material, across many scales of operation. As Elul puts it, there's a lot of unevenness factored into the way capital hits the ground. And as Rodrigo shows, every stage of capitalism builds upon the terraforming infrastructures of the previous cycles of extraction. Uh, this friction is most acute at frontiers where capital has just started to penetrate. Wild, chaotic, and lawless, the frontier is navigable only by miners uh, who live an extreme form of bare life, destratify, and lay to waste previous social natural ecologies by extracting resources from raw, material, uh, raw matter. So this, this is like a representative image from Anna Singh's work on logging in Kalimantan, Indonesia. Extraction is a two-fold process of operation. Uh, uh, it's a two-fold uh, operation of geosocial reformatting. It includes by exclusion, by the violent imposition of form on pre-existing socio-natural totalities, producing formless un unaccounted waste, both material waste and surplus populations, as much as uh, it produces useful objects and subjects. Singh's analysis, I propose, apply broadly wherever capital encounters its ends. In network parlance, I call these ends interfaces which open to life worlds in the process of subsumption. What is an interface then? It is a threshold of friction between contiguous regimes that are not fully interoperable. The surface where a code of higher complexity is converted into a more manageable one. It is a surface as much of connection as of separation, policing boundaries between information and noise, the useful and the excessive. Following Alex Galloway and Nishant Shah, I take the interface as a dialectical mode of mediation, modulating between relations of opacity and transparency, conscious interventions and non-conscious habits, embodied and machinic intelligences, ease of use, and complex processes. The interface is the racialized, gendered determination of form and formless in our bio-geopolitical systems. It does not name an object, but the binary, conjunctive, disjunctive operation of capital on its pre-existing ground. <clears throat> not all interfaces are computational in the lay sense of being graphical user interfaces or Internet of Thing objects. Yet all interfaces are computational, since capitalism is subtended by a long history of the, of the formalization and automation of thought and action, coextensive with the shaping of the general intellect, the institution of highly racialized gendered forms of labor, and the accelerated wasting away of the earth. This is from Yoha's work, uh, Coal Fired Computers, where uh, they use an old showman's engine to power up this computer by burning coal. And uh, there's this lung which blows up every time a statistic of a, a miner's uh, death via lung disease uh, shows up on the screen. If interfaces are frontiers, in what way, then, are they wild and lawless? Because that's what Anna Singh says. Uh, Wen Li Chun argues that, contrary to claims of autonomy, it is interface labor which props up the omnipotent sovereignty of networks when they break down and when they suffer a crisis of legitimization. Network protocols depend on disavowed living labor to close the gap between codus law and states of exception, that is, to perform the network's connectivity. Uh, I was reminded of this uh, analogy that Walter Benjamin draws with the Turkish automaton which has this dwarf inside who plays chess. But uh, uh, just as like Benjamin argues that uh, historical materialism requires the services of theology to fulfill its task, it seems uh, that like AI, despite all its claims of autonomy, requires 
hidden labor to perform what it does. Someone must clean up, repair, maintain, so that the system does not crash. Or as Hito style suggests, minor, minoritarian people are always disappearing into the cracks and black boxes of network culture, leaving behind spam avatars as proxies. Though key to, uh, though key to capital cell valorization, proxy people remain un unaccounted by it. They open up the network to the space of the general, but only by preparing the outside into a bubble of reduced complexity commensurate with the ma machine's capacities. Too much noise might crash the fragile system. After all, capital's value form can handle only so much of the formless ground in which it is situated. Perhaps to tease Kalen's provocation against the grain, network unavail uh, unavailable might after all point to another direction than the inevitability of, out of the outside subsumption into the network. Thank you. Thank you, um, all of you, to, for your presentations. I think it was really interesting um, inquiry into network that you, all of you are doing that is um, actually questioning, um, as we have been for some time, the idea of networks that is based on edges and nodes and sort of thinking about more complex uh, relations that are part of that. And uh, um, starting with, uh, with you, Kaylin, who uh, suggested this opportunities or, or the um, potentials of networks that are uh, inaccessible, that, um, that maybe produce other ways of, or other th uh, possibilities for, for connecting or um, 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 reaching um, and coming up with new uh, forms of expression in that way. And I also um, really appreciated your, um, uh, um, your um, bringing out for us this, um, this um, um, idea or the territory of the surround uh, and the surround as a quite a complex um, space that is perhaps the, in the examples that you gave us is imagined through this exploration, 3D exploration as well and as a way to kind of, um, yes, to, th to think about surround as a, um, as a kind of productive, um, maybe not productive, but, but you know, uh, surround as a place that kind of hides something and that, that um, um, invites, uh, ec Yes, that's, another, that's maybe a question to you, invites what kind of exploration does it invite? Um, and then in the, in the digital hunting that um, uh, Pablo, you suggesting, um, the, the question of techno territories, I'm, I'm quite curious about um, sort of ex expanding little, or thinking a little bit more about this techno territories, yet they're still referring to human and non-human and ecological territories too, and, and how those ecological territories are, are being mapped by, by these technologies and, and, uh, and complexities of how human um, uh, politics and, uh, and, uh, um, are entering these, te technology, um, these territories. And finally, um, um, Sudipto, um, you are kind of trying to, it seems to me like you are offering a, a, another interface for us to look at it and I wonder if it's um, um, if the um, the interface uh, critique is is, um, is able to um, um, to um, take into account all, the, all these complex relations that you at the same time um, um, suggesting are, are taking place so um, I don't know if you maybe while um, if there is anything that you would like to comment or add, and while um, that's happening, there is, I think there might be a microphone. There is, there is a microphone and there is a question already, so, so maybe let's... Um, thanks everyone, that was, uh, that was really great. Um, I have two questions really, one for the second paper and then one for the third paper, sorry. Um, uh, the, um, I, I think, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Wendy Chun's uh, article called Homophily, um, where she, uh, I think, criticizes Jameson's notion of cognitive mapping uh, as being not something that describes what neoliberalism is, but actually that mimics it in a way, so it, it just repeats the... So I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on that. Uh, and then it, with regard to hunting, um, I was wondering what the kind of political implications of, of that his, is historically, because um, uh, I guess, you know, you, there's an element of where you, you hunt for food and there's kind of nourishment in that, so what is the kind of... Uh, the cut here in, the, in, that, in that sense, I guess. That's it. Oh, okay. 
Thank you for your question, because I, I'm aware that the cognitive mapping is a complicated concept, not just uh, how we can rethink about cognitive mapping for today's neoliberal mechanisms as well as computational media, because uh, Jameson wrote, it, wrote about it in the 80s, which was another moment of crisis with globalization that we are facing right now but another, uh, in another way. Uh, but um, I understand Wendy Chun's uh, argument, but I, I feel like that's why I'm emphasizing to surround rather than like, going beyond to what interface does and like the capture that happens around the interface. But I do believe that like the cognitive mapping is actually more about like how we understand the dialectics between cultural and economic realms, like the culture is captured, it, it is in the Wendy Mandertun's argument, but I'm trying to um, understand the dialectics of culture and economy or the realms and as well as local and global in a more complex way than I do think that like I don't want to dismiss cognitive mapping. Um, so that's why actually my emphasis on the surround comes from the fact that like we can still see how the different political encounters and resonances take place um, in the surround of these um, mechanisms of capture, um, like the flows of labor, care, waste, that media produce and, and, and are embedded uh, within. Um, but I also very briefly add that actually cognitive mapping for me is also more tricky concept to deal with from a post-colonial perspective as well, because who is the subject of cognitive mapping, like, or what is cognition today? So I would be happy to talk later more about it. I, I'm, um, I'm, I'm aware of the complicatedness of this, like, the concept. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, hunting, I guess it, it's a, I'm starting to think a lot about this topic. It's a very complex topic that you can trace back to uh, Anthropocene theories about hunting and gathering and how humans uh, started creating um, settlements from there. But I think uh, hunting uh, foregrounds by necessity a political relationship between bodies because it's an act of uh, possessing and controlling, the possibility of possessing and controlling another body. And I think that w where the cut lies really is that um, there's a difference between uh, hunting for survival versus hunting for uh, excess and for feeding uh, multiple systems uh, of capital and consumption and production. Um, and I think that there is something uh, to be looked at. I haven't looked at this yet, but it's something that I'm trying to explore now, reading some uh, anthropologists that work in the Amazon basin. Um, what is really the difference between the historical practices of hunting in uh, different Amerindian cultures versus the European colonial culture that uh, ended up uh, conquering the entire world. One of the main uh, differences that I've been able to trace is the idea of, um, in, in the Amazon basin, of hunting other animals that are seen as people through a series of uh, rituals and cosmologies that, uh, through consuming the body, uh, the body also the hunter's body becomes part of that other body that is being hunted. Whereas I think in the more uh, European-based uh, uh, hunting for sport practice, uh, there is an implicit control, uh, like an anthropocentric control over territories and non-human bodies. Um, but yeah, it's a great question, I'm not sure. Thank you. There's another question. Hi. Uh, great talks. Um, in relation to the third paper, uh, the correlation between the uh, the internet and the uh, trade routes, uh, is there any, any other correlation than just geographical positions of different things, like it's easiest from A to B? Is there any other correlation uh, you found with the hunting? Uh, the digital hunting, other than just a You mean geographic. between uh, cargo ship trading yeah, routes yeah, and exactly. in underwater sea cables? Exactly, exactly. 
Yeah, that's I good. mean, uh, there's uh, the correlation is not necessarily direct. It's not like it's exactly the same routes. It's also a very speculative relation. Um, I mean, the first cable, transoceanic cable, that was laid between uh, New York and London for the tele uh, for the telegraph um, by Morse, uh, you can trace that in different. Uh, the the uh, you can relate that also to the triangle, the slavery and colonial triangle that was established between the Americas, Africa, and and Europe. Um, you can trace different geographical connections, different industry connections. Uh, for example, uh, Telmex, uh, a Mexican company that owns most of the underwater sea cables in South America and Central America. They also have a big um, shipping industry uh, complex uh, of, of cell phones, particularly. So, so there are different multiple layers of connections uh, which could be explored. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Are there any more questions uh, from the audience? I, oh, I, sorry. <laughs> there is an audience. Yeah. Um, thanks a lot for a great panel. Um, uh, of course, uh, you share, you, you all talk about this sort of decentralization, the sort of everywhere and nowhere uh, of, of the current. Uh, uh, ne uh, internet or network, um, um, and I guess my question is mainly to 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 Kaelin and Sudip to where you, you also seem to point to that there might be opportunities in this sort of every awareness that 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 allows for poten potential opportunities, uh, um, or new opportunities, uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, so uh, my, my answer to your question is that A, um, uh, that uh, I, I'm still skeptical about uh, um, this new China ideology and that I need to confess. Uh, but B, um, that uh, if we put um, this idea into this um, global data network uh, as a parallel, then uh, I see opportunity to see more autonomous model rather than a unified or totalitarian model that uh, at the end will uh, give a severe control t to knowledge and uh, other aspects of life. So, uh, but I don't have a conclusive statement yet, but uh, deep down, really skeptical, please don't happen, yeah. Yeah, I sort of have an answer both for uh, your question, Christian, and Magda, your question. Uh, how, how can we think of the interface with all this complexity, as you are saying? There, uh, like, uh, even though Elun and I apparently have this disagreement, I think we both agree on the same thing. <laughs> uh, because I think that the interface cannot be separated from the surround. Like, the interface is like a cut into the surround, and uh, which leaves certain things out and include certain things and any sort of interface criticism has to uh, take into account the surround in which it is situated. So that's one uh, aspect of it. The other aspect of it is to think of the interface be, uh, beyond ideas of use value or utilitarianism, which is where I was trying to fall back upon this uh, model of the formless essentially and this I'm drawing upon uh, Bataille and Seth Franklin to some extent. The idea that like the formless is something that always escapes and is always excessive to the creation of form and uh, capital entirely the capital's value form essentially uh, arises from this uh, formless sociality and naturality if we can call it that which pre-exists capitalism but which is also excessive to capitalism so when capital captures it there is always this remaindering which is happening so uh, where uh, where I can see the sort of possibility for like a, for new opportunities is precisely if we could like think of interfaces and design interfaces precisely from the perspective not of use but of uh, play let us say or if play still sounds too neoliberal given how play has been co-opted from non-use 
from something that is excessive to use. It is precisely, I feel, utilitarianism which introduces the problem into interface. Uh, if, we, if the interface is ideological, as Galloway is uh, pointing out, it is precisely because the interface is made to do this particular task which we think that it needs to do. If we can think of interfaces beyond that need, perhaps the problem wouldn't be there. Elul, would you like to say something about um, <laughs> the surround um, view of that? Uh, we started with a disagreement. What, <laughs> like, apparently we have a similar perception, understanding of interface. Um, I mean, as I just mentioned with my um, previous answer, like. Um, <coughs> Uh, when we look at the surround, actually, we can um, open a space for some interventions. And for me, it's really important to develop like a transnational perspective. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm emphasizing the flows of like a labor, care, and waste. Um, in that sense, like um, we are not uh, presenting. While we are highlighting these uh, opportunities or potentials, we are not like. We usually have a very pessimistic view of things, where, like where things are going in terms of like the expansion of extraction. But at the same time, um, if you look at the surround, I think it's um, it's a place that is like much complex. So it's like a more room for negotiate and um, um, like a beyond the logic of capital uh, in terms of like a, um, productive logic of it. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Um, we have um, time probably for one more question from the floor. Um, do not be shy. <laughs> I guess uh, maybe I asked a question that I've asked uh, when, you, when we got together or when you got together and organized yourselves in, um, in this particular panel. And my question was um, um, referring to the fact that uh, uh, you all come and you all talk about subjects that kind of have been defined in a particular way in uh, terms of relation between cent center and periphery, I guess. Um, and I just wanted to ask you to comment. Uh, my comment when we were talking about it was, um, why is it kind of, are we re regionalizing ourselves in that kind of, are we categorizing ourselves, are we following certain labels of, um, of groupings or clusterings that have been predefined? And, uh, and I wondered if you had any thoughts on that clustering, the clustering that you've proposed and you got together. <laughs> um, I think maybe what, uh brings together a lot of our interests and, and it's something that is, it's talked about a lot, uh, especially with the intersection of uh, decolonial theories and network theories, is this idea of the global south, right? But what we were talking, I think Elud mentioned it in her talk very well, is that these relationships are not that clear cut uh, reg uh, in terms of regions, right? It's not like, uh, it's not a geopolitical game of north and south with a clear uh, dividing line. It's more complex and it flows precisely the, uh, this mobility and this fluidity of um, not only capital but also multiple layers of um, domination and control. So I think maybe what, what united uh, this, this sort of regional approach to borders and uh, particular pla places at the edges of networks is trying to really understand what, are, what is that division really? What is this uh, post-colonial division that is still very present and that we all feel uh, that is inescapable to some extent in the way the network has been designed and put together. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, um, I agree. <laughs> Just like at a, uh, yesterday when we were getting ready for the, this panel, uh, we were making jokes about like uh, we should get a word of diversity because we are coming from all these regions, mm -hmm. like uh, represented very equally, like Asia, Middle East, mm -hmm. Latin America, India. Um, but I think it, it reflects something because um, we really like we present these examples, but we are not presenting them like, oh, how we are using uh, media or uh, produced or media theory produced 
in, in the center, which we already complicated, like center periphery mm -hmm. divide, but like, but actually it's, uh, we are presenting like how actually global capitalism operates in locality and we need to understand how it operates in the locality, but also as a mechanism, um, as in like a um, context, also understand like what, like what global capitalism mm -hmm. does uh, and also the role of computational media in that mm -hmm. sense. Great, thank you. I think that's um, time for us. Thank you very much. Please uh, join me. And I think we have five minutes to sit up and to uh, you take over. Pleasure to introduce the second panel. Many of the threads from the first panel will be picked up here and made specific in different ways. Um, this panel we've called Translating Reindexing and de-archiving media cultures. There are three presentations. First, we'll start off with Giseli Vanconcelos and Tatiana Wells. They're artists from Brazil working as a collective together with Cristina Ribas, who isn't here. And their work is about, I mean, you'll, you'll hear, is about de-archiving histories of tactical media in a Brazilian context. Then we'll move on to Julia Glushneva, who is a PhD student at Concordia University, working on translation and histories of Russian VHS tape networks. And then the third presentation will be by, by Rodrigo Ochegami, and he's a PhD student at MIT, working on the politics of search and some alternative strategies. So, over to you. First of all, Giseli and Tati. I think we have ah. changed the order. Okay, but so you didn't, I yeah. Start. All right, fine. Okay. Okay, so my name is Julia, and I'm working on translation, on, um, on the research dealing with the relationship between translation and network. Interlinguistic translation is an important aspect of both the network imaginary and uh, the development of network technological cultures. On the one hand, translation is seen as what uh, contributes to the image of the world as a structure composed of links and nodes. And uh, translation by pro promises us uh, to help to overcome the language difference. And by promising this, uh, we, uh, it sustains the network utopia of flexibility, openness, uh, interdependence, and extensibility. At the same time, on a practical level, translation is, a, uh, is an omnipresent element of the networks we use today. And it's visible in our everyday communication, media consumption, education, and so on. Uh, translation itself has become a powerful network medium uh, actively employed and differently adapted to multiple spheres such as urban planning or medicine. So there is a lot of place for translation in the network world. Uh, today our discussion of uh, translation and networks in relation to each other is mostly dominated by uh, two narratives. The first narrative, uh, typical of both the corporate and academic debates, uh, is a narrative about machine translation and a universal language. In describing their work, contemporary translation companies and developers, such as Google for example, usually rely on the analogy of closed towers offered by the father of machine translation, Warren Weaver, in 1949. And the point of this analogy is that in order to establish meaningful communication between independent, separated, uh, closed towers, uh, uh, it's useless to shout from tower to tower. And what we need is to go down uh, to the basement of all towers, where the basement refers to the universal language or interlingua. And here, this search for the universal language for interlingua becomes a guiding principle in the development of translation tools as well as an understanding of what translation means in general. For academic circles in turn, 
this excavation of interlingua becomes uh, a serious political and ethical problem and uh, becomes a starting point for the critique of uh, corporate approach to translation and translation cultures. Uh, the second dominant narrative is one that foregrounds the role of computation and the internet. Uh, and this narrative rarely takes into account the role of older uh, network media such as radio or television in translation. And this narrative uh, occasionally pays attention to the histories of translation practices, ideas, and electronic systems beyond the computer network. So, and uh, this reduction of translation and translation culture to computers uh, uh, results in the fact that there is a tendency to see translation along with the network almost exclusively through the histories of the Cold War, military initiatives, and academic institutions. In this regard, we, I think uh, it would be productive to ask what are other cultural and material histories translation and network share together, and where we can find uh, those kind of histories. Among those, among those histories uh, is a history of Russian VHS culture, in the 1980s and uh, in the 1980s and 1990s. So, and usually thinking of Russian video culture, the first thing we will perhaps remember is piracy. At the same time, what is equally crucial is the amplified reliance of this culture on interlinguistic translation, usually performed by means of voiceover, which allowed us to hear, uh, to simultaneously hear both. Uh, original language tracks and vocal translation. Uh, translation was and still is foundational for Russian video highly dependent on foreign language content. And if we talk about everyday life, foreign films, TV shows, educational programs, and many other numerous genres, including pornography or religious sermons, uh, these genres on video were the main object of consumption uh, in the period of the radical displacement of local culture a few years before and after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Both translation and pirate networks were, and again still are, be, uh, be, become basic, uh, they still are uh, basic modes of video circulation and consumption for the societies that had lived uh, in condition of closed borders and information scarcity. And here translation becomes a necessary uh, condition for functioning on, uh, of infrastructure and it also uh, allows us to see the channels of uh, video circulation. At the same time, uh, translation, uh, this, uh, specifically this practice uh, and this culture of video translation embodies the, con uh, the confluence between video and other translation technologies such as systems of simultaneous interpreta uh, interpretation developed for international meetings, systems used in international telecasts, and many others. And this confluence is especially reflected in the fact that the mode of translational performance peculiar uh, to these technologies was transferred to video. And so formal language of international diplomacy, bureaucratic communication, bureaucratic, uh, bureaucratic language, uh, and television cross-cultural communication, this kind of language became an intimate part of home video entertainment, home video experience. And the use of this language was essential uh, for labor of video tran translators who worked in the conditions of so fast production, they could translate up to seven uh, videotapes per day, and the network was uh, functioning and video was circulating through the voices of these translators, exhausted translators, bored translators. So, and of course they couldn't but make errors. And these voices and erroneous translations played the key role in the formation of post-socialist uh, cultural canons and habits of media consumption while providing us an insight into aesthetic, life, uh, into aesthetic uh, lives and effects of the network. And this give, uh, gives us a very rich platform to think of how translation and different types of technologies and different uh, cultural contexts can work together. So this is what I'm doing. Yeah.
essa é a sua imagem. Essa né? é a sua imagem. Calma, calma. calma. Deveria ser o próximo. Uh -oh. Eu vou voltar. Então, não, é o primeiro. Você sabe, é a segunda imagem. Yeah, we need the video. Yes, yeah. Ah, you told me, sorry, you told me. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. Uh, we're gonna, we are doing this work together. It's actually three of us today. We're only two, but uh, we're gonna try to share as much as we can. Our work is called Tatsuko Archives. And we're going to explain a little bit the context of why we've chosen this, um, the format of this research as a cartography. Uh, cartography can be thought in, in many different ways. For this work, we propose a visual cartography that covers a series of publications, events, festivals, and also brings the political context of Brazil in the time frame from 2002 to 2018, opening towards the future. We chose cartography as a research method for thinking collectively. Individuals are not solely in this world. Subjectivity is not produced within individuality. It is produced collectively. The concept of cartography is here associated with subjectivity studies, which makes possible the singularization of its cartographers. Here, we assume that cartography can also produce equally and visually, producing a trajectory when looking at the history of these productions around the internet, technical media and more. So one can think that cartography can be used as a tool for the co-production of subjectivity of being in the world and its path to make see a series of processes and productions that these subjects, individuals and collectives develop. Uh, we decided to bring this production in its visuality for the need to be able to see the power of this history, the power of this production, so that we could also create this space for navigation in which more people who belong or do not belong to these networks can project their own trajectory. From the year thousands onwards, Brazil has been producing an infinity of initiatives that put in, into practice the development of technical media, sorry. Inspired by marginal and hybrid perspectives that have sprung by counterculture associations in low-tech reinventions. Uh, alongside the media culture of the 90s that have influenced digital arts practice. In the years that followed, unseen connections would appear between the artistic production and digital culture in the realm of public policy. For example, as well as, as, well as proposal from arts and media groups and social struggles in direct relation with vulnerable groups, such as groups with no access to media at all. We decided to use cartography as a method of research as this research runs through our lives as producers, developers, non-artists, artists. artists um, Sorry. <laughs> uh, engaged in digital production networks, internet, tactical media, and free knowledge. In 2008, in Sao Paulo, we decided to share our experiences, not just the three of us, but in a larger group of nine to ten women, and of course, thinking broader collective experiences in relation to this production. Organized and systematized with its own processual, the archive or de-archiving is done extensively as well intensively. We want, to, we, we want the intensive part of the cartography to be activated from the personal experience of the participants and the perception of their life trajectory in relation to the political moment that Brazil was living and is living right now. As such, feminism is invoked, conjured, for it reclaims a technology of care and repair. As Bella Casa sustains the maintenance of technical infrastructures as a practice of care, creation and reproduction of life. 
We think the four-day archive from recombination and an extension, producing it as a political, poetic tactic, a design, a curatorship that confronts the discourses of mainstream techno-narratives. So we see cartography as a super technical tool for the present when it's necessary to look again at this techno politics. For this production of digital culture, of a free knowledge, a crucial moment for us to be able to reorganize the present in order to project new futures. Uh, to finish, uh, Tactical Archives is based on the idea of intellectual generosity, a legacy that stands not only as the content based on publications, but also as a political attitude that starts in a certain way at the beginning of the Brazilian internet and keeps following the changes in the Brazilian political context. The cloud of concepts that this curatorship in literature brings would be dispersed by all this digital garbage and enclosures that we have today, including, especially in Brazil, censorship and deliberate apagamentos, erasure, erasures. Our main concern with the de-archiving and organizing of this data, it is a political preoccupation that indeed is not about the future, it is about the present. Okay, with love and care, thank you very much. All right, so... Oh yeah, okay, cool. All right. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so most uh, commercial search engines and recommender systems are boring by design. Their definitions of importance and relevance are typically based on measures of popularity and similarity. So I mostly get results that are predictable and well-known and results that are closely related to what I've already seen. But I contend that this isn't inevitable. Uh, it's largely a consequence of the priorities of the online ad advertising industry. Alternative search engines, based on different principles, are quite possible, even if largely unexplored. So today, uh, I want to share one of my experiments um, with the design of alternative search engines and recommender systems, uh, in particular with methods for searching for divergent perspectives rather than popular and similar ones. So let's take a public data set um, of music listening. Okay, so I have a data set that's about uh, 10 years old. Uh, it's from last FM users uh, who publicly shared the music they listened to. Now suppose we ran a standard algorithm for music recommendation on that data set. Um, the algorithms would produce a table of similarity uh, based on statistical correlation between isms and user activities. So, you know, like users who listen to X also listen to Y, right? So, um, this is the case with, you know, Last FM's own algorithm for similar artists, right? Uh, you know, if I listen to, say, The Velvet Underground, uh, the algorithm would, would recommend associated acts uh, like uh, Lou Reed, a member of the band himself, uh, or the Stooges from the same American protopunk scene. So that's quite predictable. Okay? Um, so I modified an algorithm to prioritize results for, uh, from uh, outside the North Atlantic instead. Okay? So I did this project in Brazil um, five years ago, um, and, it's, and it remained offline since then. So today I am relaunching it, uh, and it's online as of a few hours ago, uh, so it's called Pluralized, and this is how it goes. Uh, so let's try, uh, you know, the Velvet Underground as an input. All right, so what are these results? So the algorithm's looking at users from around the world uh, who listen to the Velvet Underground, you know, then it's trying to find local artists and bands that those people also listen to. And it's prioritizing things that don't get much, much global circulation you know, in the commercial markets. Okay? Uh, so in Brazil, those people listen to Os Mutantes, a central band of the Tropicalia movement. Um, you know, in Japan, they listen to uh, 
the psychedelic rock of Yura Yura Tekoku. Um, you know, in the Czech Republic, they listen to Psi uh from the Prague underground. Right? Um, so I mean, let's try a second example. Um, you know, perhaps um, Stockhausen. All right. <laughs> So we get results like the, uh, the Japanese experimental noise band Ground Zero, uh, the Soviet electronic composer Edward Artemiev, and the Brazilian multi-instrumentalist Hermeto er Pascual. Right? So the algorithm prioritizes artists and bands which are outside the North Atlantic and which have less listeners outside their countries of origin. So uh, does anybody want to suggest an input? You know, like, you know, like what, what, what's, a, what's a band that you like? <laughs> All right, <laughs> Kanye West. All right, okay. Um, yes, yeah, so I don't know what these things are about. I mean, may maybe we can try them out. Uh, what? Wh which one do you want to click? Mavado. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't know if audio is on, but you know. Yeah, you, 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 you could try it out. <laughs> but anyway, so if you would like to try it out, uh, it's online at uh, pluralize.org. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So now we'll open up for questions, but just to perhaps to say one or two things. Um, we moved here from, you know, connecting with the previous panel, perhaps some ideas about translation across social and technical systems here, you know, with a very specific context of uh, hist history of a very particular technical practice in a very particular geolocation of Russia, to um, the development of, an, of a methodology, you know, feminist cartography, again, a sort of spatial, using spatial, a sp spatialization of a set of um, archivable uh, <laughs> details and trying to make sense of that in terms of an affirmation of the present, an affirmation of certain kinds of uh, principles of care and repair. Um, through to the, the last presentation where, you know, we're invited to, to begin to search, you know, a, um, a database based on a different, different set of principles, no longer on popularity and similarity, but on divergence and difference and opening up more, you know, perhaps of what we might call a a pluriverse. I make that. I make. I use that to link to your the name of your of your software. But um, please, I'll open up for for questions from the audience or comments as you as you would like. If nothing is forth. Oh. Okay. So, um, is there a microphone? Uh, thank you everyone for your um, presentations. I have a, a, a question uh, for the second panel. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, because in the, in the context also of uh, Brazil, I was wondering how the map or the tactic becomes open or interactive. Uh, I'm thinking about Media Ninjas WhatsApp groups and also about Iconoclasistas from Argentina. So I was wondering if you're working with that and how the map is not just a depiction or like a, an, um, a surface, but also holes can be put into it or can be connected and opened, etc. Mm -hmm. Wow, it's a good question. Uh, we are, we emphasize to make the map based on women memories. Okay, so in pretty much women that participated on the network. So Ninja Ninja was kind of like uh, very questionable for us when it came out. Uh, even if it was large in make a, a, a good work, it was actually connected to a network that we were political questionable for us. But uh, I'm not sure if we, we did include, I think we didn't include them yet. But yet because I in that point, in two uh, uh, upgrades of the map, we di didn't come out 
you know so it's more like what is the memory in the discussion of the reunion that we do like what has come out with the people that we're working like in presence okay and we prioritize women uh, uh, participation on this I'm not saying that Media Ninja doesn't have a woman, but it's a large participation of males and a large representation of very masculine uh, uh, circumstance. Uh, what else about Media Ninja? Uh, Iconoclasts. We didn't also emphasize like a Latin America. We wish to do that. Uh, it's kind of like a tool for us, like to develop, like for for long term. Like it's kind of like a life project for us. So I think like in in I. Probably, probably no. We already have a residency in Medellin uh, this year for the, the next two, next semester. So I think like it would be it would be a good participation to good moment to include other groups. And Econoclasis, for example, was a huge influence in our process of cartography. Not exactly in this one, but the other process that we did before that. That's it. Thank you for the. the uh, just to complement a little bit, uh, here in this map that we have here, uh, it says that uh, you can write your own trajectory. So I think it's sort of, it's just the beginning of uh, our cartography. And this uh, methodology of putting together women uh, was kind of the first step, really, because each of these periods has got much more to it. So the idea is to keep continue doing this with mainly women, really. Okay, we have another question. Oi. Yeah, it's me. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I was about to, to, to comment about how synthetic and kind of cold the map feels to who was actually involved with those things. You know, maybe, you know, 10 seconds of very, very quick video just to show that it's alive in a sense. But uh, actually, for addressing your comment, you. I think uh, it's important, and I will bring back some discussions we had in Santarém, in Belém, mm -hmm. in the past, not to mistake the, the role of the map. And uh, I wouldn't think that they would be doing the map to show how people can, you know, find whatever that is there. I would say it's a kind of tool to enact memories and to make sure that whoever is interested in those things would not rely on the map, but on the people. Because we have discussed a lot, uh, even, I guess, closer to, to the Amazon forest, how maps can be turned upside down and used for more control and more dominance, and how it should, at some points, even create fake maps to, you know, to divert attention to, to, to away from where it's delicate. And uh, I guess this is something to be discussed, you know, how the map can bring some expectation of automated access to specific information, but in some cases it's, it's better to conceal information on the map and show only what you want to show, not everything. That's not a question. Just more comment, yeah. Um, do we have questions for the other presenters? Yeah, here at the front. Um, where's the microphone? Yeah, I have a, a question for Julia, but I think it also relates to some of the other presentations. It regards sort of the role of um, history in your research. So why why you think this history is important? I mean, it could be approached from different, like like Jeff mentioned before, the sort of regional context and the sort of care for a particular, like, could perhaps relate to uh, Giselle and Tati's uh, talk, the sort of care for, um, yeah, for a particular group of people, or what drives you, what, what makes this history important to you? Um, so this particular history, uh, first of all, if we think of cultural background, uh, post -so the post-Soviet world is interesting as a world where translation plays extremely important role. 
And this role is visible in everyday life, in the everyday consumption, cultural consumption. Uh, it's not, and uh, everyday life of people is filtered through translation because of historical uh, conditions, because of the uh, specific political and socio-cultural history. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, information scarcity and closed borders played extremely important role uh, for uh, in this amplified uh, reliance on translation. This is uh, as I mentioned. So, but the, uh, at the same time, this region, this particular history, allows us to think of many important issues about the role of translation in the network cultures, both from the historical perspective and fr uh, contemporary perspective. It shows us that translation is neither good or bad. Uh, while today there is so many, uh, there are so many optimistic hopes around translation, and translation tends to be decontextualized. So usually it's perceived as something empty. This is just a mechanism for encoding, decoding. Uh, and this kind of discourse is very uh, actively used in the contemporary network debates and in popular culture as well. So translation is just encoding, decoding, and it allows us to communicate. Uh, it allows us to overcome cultural problems and so on. So it allows us to uh, cross cultural, political, social uh, b uh, boundaries. At the same time, and, and uh, reliance on this kind of discourse doesn't allow us to see something more behind translation. It's important uh, political and cultural role. So, and by looking at such kind of histories as, for example, Russia, uh, we can understand deeper uh, the role of translation and its uh, high political charge and uh, the fact that it's not neutral uh, and it always has something behind it. But there is a, uh, there is a lot of other <coughs> translation cultures that are not less interesting than uh, post-socialist translation cultures. So this is just a very uh, bright example. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Sorry, did you have a question? Is it directed at Rodrigo? I hope it is. Uh, yeah, it is, it is actually. Um, uh, I, w I was just curious about your claim that, that we don't have these kind of search engines, right? We have only have somebody that searches for what's equal or like, or, and, and, and we don't have the ones that searches for divergence. And, and you know, I could easily see this as the next way of searching being implemented in, say, Spotify, because, because it's useful, right? You know, it, it would allow me to hear music I, I, I didn't find in, in other ways. So, so in that sense, uh, uh, you know, to what degree do you see this as a, as a criticism or as a development of new, you know, useful search engines that could perhaps also help us to find more um, different kinds of material or to, or, or to engage with different kinds of material, which of course brings several of the other speakers into the picture, uh, you know, the difference between languages and, and cultural context, etc. Mm -hmm. um, so my experiment, I chose the categories of the previous panel, borders on neoliberal play and extractivism. <laughs> you know, like, you know there, there, I mean, there, there's something about it that, yeah, you know, you're right, you know, like flirts very closely with it, but I, I don't think I would, um, and to be honest, that's one of the reasons why I didn't leave it online, because you know, like I didn't want it to become that, right? You know, I think the, the you know, my my original interest was, you know, one that was, um, you know, like playful in a sense, and it was about demonstrating the possibility of a different kind of, um, you know, like search engine or recommender system, right? Um, you know, I do think that the. Uh, that the assumptions that are baked in m most uh, search engines and recommender systems today, um, you know, are yeah largely a consequence of you know the political economy of you know advertising and different kinds of industries that shape that field, right? So you know if you if you read um, if you read textbooks of information retrieval, you know like a, you know like across time, you'll see different concerns coming in and definitions of importance and relevance shifting, uh, you know, like in order to follow those. I mean, in particular, I mean, advertising since the 90s has shaped 
pretty much all of that field. Right? You know, the, the, the most mainstream metrics used to, to assess performance and such. Um, so, uh, you know, like with, you know, like something simple like this, which is, you know, like about, you know, like extending the scope of what, recommend, what recommendations, uh, you know, can happen in music. Um, yeah, I think it's, you know, for me mostly useful as a demonstration of, of the possibilities. Mm -hmm. You know, personally, um, you know, as of late, you know, I've shifted, uh, I've, I've shifted these experiments more towards, you know, like finding critical and divergent perspectives in libraries. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, in, in particularly, is quite inspired by, uh, you know, studying the history of, of resistance and contestation to the computerization of libraries in the 1970s by uh, a feminist, indigenous, and liberation theology activists who were librarians and were trying to advance different kinds of indexing of various sorts. Right? Um, so, yeah, so, you know, when I demonstrate something like this, it's something more playful and tongue in cheek. It's, uh, <laughs> and it's, it's an invitation to, to you know, like join something that's either just curious and that flirts with neoliberal play, but hopefully it doesn't end there. <laughs> okay, so pointing to alternative possibilities which have um, yeah, more efficacy in terms of neoliberal critique is where we need to end that panel. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, the, the presenters uh, addressing um, the subject matter of like uh, machine imagination, classification and infrastructure. So uh, we have four speakers here. So the first one uh, is uh, Nanya Grumman, who is a PhD student uh, in the Department of Arts and Cultural Studies at University of Copenhagen in Denmark. So she has a background in art history and cultural studies. So and next to her is Nikolai uh, Bossi, who is a freelance, um, freelance writer and PhD student in media and cultural studies at the University of uh, Cellphone. So, and then we have, uh, next to him, we have uh, Linda Krumman, who is a media artist, as well as a researcher, and currently a PhD candidate at the University of Bergen. And then lastly, we have Tienta uh, Seiss, is a PhD researcher interested in critical software studies, digital methods, who is a re uh, researcher right now uh, at the University of uh, Siegen in Germany. So uh, we will have five minutes each for each presenter, same as the previous two panels, and then we'll open up the floor for discussion uh, with uh, 20 minutes. So pass the floor to you, Nanya. Um, my case study is media, wait, and, uh, sorry, <laughs> minor detail. Can you hear me? Okay, cool. Um, my case study is the digitization of the uh, Abibabu's Nimesuna Atlas. And uh, at this rather early stage of my um, project, I am engaged with the organizational logic behind the uh, montage pieces that I made. And what makes the atlas interesting to me is how the images on the different panels cannot be aggregated as fragments of a whole, insofar as the um, relationship between the different images on the panel cannot be reduced to the iconographic typology of the panel itself. For example, panel C, shown here, is uh, titled Deve um, Developments in the Representation of Mars Detachment from the Anthropomorphizing Conception Image. But the uh, panel is uh, not a display of various representations of Mars. In the upper right corner, we have an image of Mars personified as uh, Perseus, the mythical god of war. On the uh, left, we have three illustrations of Mars by astronomer Johannes Kepler. And um, on the right side, we have press cuttings depicting Zeppelins who, whose creation marks a step towards, making, towards space travel. So the um, connections between the individual images and the title of the uh, Numesine Atlas are indexical, insofar as an image on the panel is an expression occasioned by a specific experience of being in the world, which does not apply to humankind at large. Um, so I'm attempting to bridge Valbuk's work with machine learning, specifically the classification of image content by convolutional neural networks, because, that, because I believe it raises some of the same questions as those um, concerning Valbuk in his own time, including that of the relation between images and text, form and content. Um, let's see here. 
So with the, um, with the help of uh, Fabian Offert, who is a PhD candidate at UC Santa Barbara, I've had some uh, fun uh, experimenting with scraping and plotting images from the Warburg Institute's iconographic database. And this here is a plot of about 9,000 images at the second to last layer of a convolutional neural network trained on a thousand categories um, from ImageNet. And what I think makes the image interesting is that looking at it, it does not make sense to ask uh, whether the clusters are assembled by way of a formal or a semantic resemblance because it is both. As a visualization of the way the convolutional neural network has clustered the images before the output layer, the network has yet to settle on a specific relation between an image and an output class. Um, and I think this montage is interesting in relation to Balbourg, uh, not only because it, as an assemblage, somehow resembles the atlas, but also because the representational structure of the visualization of this um, prediction space between imagery, imagery at the input layer and classification layer challenges a tendency to theorize the uh, migration of images on the Nimusuna atlas as either the continuation of a formal or a semantic scheme. And uh, yeah, so my hypothesis is that this assemblage, assemblage is somehow more alike Barbrook's atlas than the contemporary atlases made by artists such as Trevor Paglin. I have an image here. Um, whereas works like his uh, indeed provide a lot of insights into the world we teach, is, sorry, we teach machines to see by way of exposing this troubling uh, pairing of images and labels within training data sets. This plot, oh, sorry. Um, this plot, I believe, provides insights into how machine sees, and this might very well be a simplified way of putting it, but I think that the organizational logic of these two compositions differ in that the one by Pagel is a representation of a predefined connection between images and words whereas the plot is a display of the perception of this relation at a given moment in the prediction process. The first is indeed reproduced in the second, but I think that the distinction is important because it raises questions of the relationship between representation and perception, not unlike Warburg's display of indexical images on panel C. And uh, whereas I'm nowhere suggesting that neural networks are deductive in their prediction of image content, I think that it might be interesting to highlight the multiplicity of possible connections between word and images in order to challenge the tendency to apply form content dichotomies to the internal logic of CNNs. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Nicola Bozzi. I'm a PhD student at Salford. And my presentation is about tagging, and more specifically, why we need uh, a cultural critical approach to, to explore it. So the main reason that I'm uh, interested in tagging and uh, my angle on it is uh, tagging as a form of identity labeling, a kind of an operational form of identity labeling. And as, um, as it's known, uh, identity labeling is generally very fraught and charged, and it has a very specific history that's been studied from different perspectives. We can think about labeling theories, a sociological school from Chicago. We can think of theories about intersectionality, uh, and we can think about more recent theorizations, uh, like uh, Wendy Chun and um, Clemens Aprich and other theorists in uh, pattern discrimination, especially about this kind of idea of a covert identity politics, preserving categorization in the age of big data and social media. So what I'm looking at uh, in my research question, if you will, is does the efficiency of tagging naturalize identity labeling practices? Does it make it so seamless and so immediate that we accept the categorization without questioning it? And this is kind of where I come from. My approach to tagging um, stems from my disappointment with the image of the tech cloud that is kind of, it used to be at least the go-to uh, figure to imagine tagging and conceptualize it. And uh, with Galloway, I agree that uh, with um, algorithmic efficiency, sometimes you have a decrease in uh, a symbolic efficiency, at least in the, in the case of the tech cloud. So I'm more inspired in my exploration of tagging by the type of figuration advocated for and developed in feminist and uh, critical theory 
uh, because I feel like it preserves the complexity of the labeling gesture uh, as both a fact of a social fact, like an interaction being made, something that happens, but also there is a world-changing fiction or perhaps a dystopian fiction happening, something that's been evoked, perhaps a stereotype that's been um, evoked, represented, suggested, uh, or some other kind of cultural view, let's say. So when I look at tagging, uh, both in terms of hashtags, um, adding users, or even geotagging, I look at it as a, um, as a gesture that contributes to collective performance akin to a relational aesthetics of sorts, if you will. So what I've, what I've been doing in my research, uh, this is not ex my, all of my research, but let's say the final part of my research is about, um, I interviewed a few artists, theorists, and activists who use the tagging as a, as a way to kind of question this process of classification and categorization happening in social media and kind of inject a little bit of criticality back into the discourse. So the first example uh, is the Catonaccio official is just this um, very trollish South Park-esque um, Instagram account. And the Twitter bio reads, a former Marlboro model turned influencer to pay my monster student debt. And uh, the way that uh, Katonachi um, gets a, a follow, following on Instagram is by using clickbait cat-related hashtags. So he puts cats in the picture, despite really not really being a fan of cats or even owning a cat, to kind of divert the traffic and call, call attention to his kind of desperate attempt at paying back the student debt. Then we have Elena Suarez Val, who is a researcher. She's doing a PhD about uh, geotagging in, as a form of feminist activism, especially in Latin America, because in Latin America apparently there is, uh, the, the idea of the body as territory is very strong in terms of po post-colonial discourse. And so she speaks to that by mapping feminist sites in Uruguay and uh, examining other types of geolocation. And this, I think, speaks a lot to the politics of location, which is very important in feminism, but also this idea of the politics of geolocation, I think, is a good counterpoint to the stack, which is very much the kind of dissolving human specificity and agency, I think, as vivid, as, as inspiring as it is a theory. Final example, Max Dovey, uh, is, is, this piece is called the hipster bar, and basically it's uh, in Dovey trained an algorithm to recognize a hipster. And by doing, it basically it used Instagram imagery tagged with the word hipster uh, to, to, to train it to recognize anybody just by looking at their face. And obviously, as you can imagine, this is a very cumbersome and ultimately failing approach. And this was kind of Max Dovey's way to kind of demonstrate, one, that machine learning and artificial intelligence are not really as seamless as we would think, and also the, to kind of challenge the stereotypes themselves, because ultimately they are contradictory and failing always, even outside of this um, type of infrastructures. So this was my, my research, if you want to follow me you can, and uh, I have a paper about uh, the digital nomad and the politics of geotagging, it's, I think it's, uh, social media and society. I don't know when it's coming out, but it kind of fills in the gap between the introduction of this paper and the end, which are the beginning and the end of my thesis, and that's kind of a, an example from the middle of my thesis, in case you're curious. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, hello everybody. So, as we already were introduced, I'm just going to continue from that. So, I'm a PhD student uh, uh, studying how machine vision is represented in digital art. And I do this as a part of a, a team called, uh, and, and a part of a project. And the name of the project is Machine Vision in Everyday Life. And we explore how algorithmic images are affecting us. Uh, as a society and as individuals. So, a central task in these digital humanities projects is to build a database and to collect about 1,000 machine vision situations from digital artworks, narratives and games. And this is the, uh, the current database. And uh, and database and um, I, uh, here I have logged Anna Riddle's mosaic virus and her training set myriad tulips into the current iteration of the database. 
So mosaic virus is an artwork of uh, machine-generated botanical uh, impossibilities in which the tulip's appearance is shaped by the training data set as well as the fluctuating value of Bitcoin. So in the database, uh, on the work level, we log technologies used or referenced, the topic of cre the creative work and sentiments toward machine vision represented in the work. Uh, but each work also has linked one or more machine vision situations. Sorry. Machine vision uh, situations into this. And the most interesting thing uh, in this machine visualization situation is that it's designed um, to allow us to describe the relation between various entities and uh, machine vision by asking uh, who does what. So uh, the focus on doing emerges from our interest of uh, or how agency is just distributed between hum, human and non-human entities. And as we are using post-human theory in our approach to analyze machine vision, uh, we also consider technical devices as cognizers, hence uh, we see meaning as kind of doing. Catherine Hales argues that technical devices can be understood as cognizers in complex human technical assemblages. Uh, by redefining uh, cognition, she provides us a framework to analyze how the human and technical intertwine uh, in cognitive assemblages. By looking at who does what, uh, we recognize Hale's observation that cognitive assemblages have punctuated agency, meaning that there are longer period, periods when human agency is crucial uh, to achieve shorter periods periods of machine autonomy. So what is the artist doing? Uh, in this example, uh, uh, the artist is selecting tulips uh, and photographing them. She's creating categories and labeling the tulips according to the created taxonomy, hence classifying them. And the uh, artist uh, agency both shapes and, and the perception and the operation of the vision machine. <clears throat> so, in the process of logging artworks into the machine vision database, I have recognized uh, a number of interactions uh, which contribute into shaping machine vision. Selecting, collecting, categorizing, classifying, and cleaning are activities in which presumptions, biases, and stereotypes are embedded into machine vision systems. As I try to explore how we can understand a vision machine's internal milieu, uh, biosemiotic uh, Jakob von Uxekl's definition of subjective universes as umwelts is useful as it directs us from considering that machines today are not only seeing, but also on some levels perceiving. Hales adapts uh, Uxekl's definition and urges us to understand how human and technical umwelts overlap. Whereas uh, Mitra Azar, who has also been around here, mm, asks us to pay attention to the gaps. The overlaps dire direct us uh, to find similarities between human and non-human cognition. As I'm interested to what extent we are externalizing our intuitive processing capabilities to machines, I ask if vision, machine, vision machines are also intuition machines. 
And what would it mean if intuition machines are used to enhance our cognitive capacities uh, in our everyday lives, assisting and optimizing decision making? Kate Carford and Trevor Pagan's ImageNet Roulette exposes how we would be profiled by one of the biggest training sets used for training in object recognition. Uh, raising questions if we are really consenting to a world of machine vision that is solely profiling us on appearance. If we, if we consider vision machines more as um, intuition machines, there is also a gap between output and decision, as there is a gap between our human intuitions and our decisions. In that gap, we doubt ourselves because of uncer uncertainty. Louis Amor argues that output of the algorithm is never placed beyond the darkness of doubt, for it carries doubt within. And she continues, doubt of human and non-human beings dwell together. Both explorations of the overlaps and the ex excavations of the gaps emerge from engaging with vision machines, not only to understand how machines see, but how they perceive things as machine vision is increasingly in increasing numbers, populating and creating new networks. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for staking with us through this uh, presentation marathon so far. Um, so my presentation is on uh, social inf uh, APIs as social interfaces. Um, so dynamic websites or most commonly platforms have one particular characteristic in common, namely the early adaptation of particular software architecture. The, adaptation, uh, the application programming interface, or the API, which is a specific piece of software that enables third-party developers, businesses, and researchers alike to programmatically access a company's data service. APIs are therefore deeply interwoven with the rise of the so-called social web and the network society. Through a process that Anna Hel Helmond calls the platformization of the web, they enable the smooth communication between service, services, apps, and devices. These APIs thus constitute an essential part of the underlying platform infrastructure that can be seen as a global connected society. They frame certain kinds of action, relationships, and power relations. Um, so APIs have been deployed in emerging online firms partly since 2002. eBay 2000, Amazon 2002, Flickr 2004, Google Maps, Facebook, and Twitter in 2006. And um, when the iPhone, uh, when Apple opened the iPhone to external developers via the App Store in 2007, the number just exploded. Um, so one approach I'm taking to study the Graph API is by mapping out um, its software architecture. Um, I think I've not managed, uh, mentioned right, like I'm looking at Facebook's Graph API mainly. <laughs> um, one approach I'm taking to study the Graph API, Facebook's uh, one, is by mapping out its software architecture, nodes, edges, and endpoints, but also things like permissions, core, um, or deprecated features. This information is available for most public-facing APIs on the developer-facing websites. Facebook calls it um, the developer's platform. Um, here they provide information about the specification of the current API version and keep track of changes in their change log. Further resources from which together with colleagues we systematically retrieve historical versions of the Graph API is an internet archive. Um, so this preliminary version of a diagram shows how those tables that I just showed before uh, from the developer's website could be thought about um, if rearranged and visualized differently. The first one on the very left um, side shows notes, um, all notes and all the possible information that can be captured and shared for each of um, them via the get method that is by, retreat, um, that is by reading it off um, what Facebook calls the social graph. On the left, no, on the right side, <laughs> Uh, on the right side, um, 
are enlarged outtakes of what constitutes a user or a page within the logics of Facebook's graph API and eventually the social graph. Um, I think the graph API shares many qualities with what Karen Knorr-Chetina calls the epistemic object. She describes them as always in the process of being materially defined. They continue to acquire new, new properties, change um, the ones they have, but this also means that objects of knowledge can never be fully attained, that they are, if you wish, never quite themselves. What we encounter in the research process are representations or stand-ins, which, is, uh, which compensate for more basic lack of object. They are things that continually explode and mutate into something else and that are as much defined by what they are not, but will at some point have become, than by what they are. Borrowing from an inventive method approach <laughs> that suggests the reappropriation of digital tools for the study of social phenomena, I suggest to think about ways to reappropriate insights from the science of knowledge, uh, from the science of knowledge constitution. This intermediate step of translation that doesn't present data, but rather wants to point toward the structure, the procedural internal operational logic of the gap between the written and the executed code that is usually remains um, invisible to the human eye. Following Knorr Katina, the topology of the graph API as an epistemic object suggests um, which way to look further through the insufficiencies they display. Um, the ins insufficiencies uh, of the diagram become particularly evident when asking for further explanation for the instrumentalization of the graph API as a means of control in market orchestration. This points towards questions that circle around the means of data production and value generation. To end the internal, uh, oops, to this end, the, in the internal email communication and court documents which had been seized by the UK government last year, but also leaked to the investigative journalist uh, Duncan, Duncan Campbell, who published the 1.4 million pages of confidential communication earlier this year, um, actually this month. So the published trove of the initial 500 pages by the UK government from last year provides insight into how Facebook's developers platform was strategically set up. The documents also shed light on how Facebook's top management exploited graph API endpoints to set particular incentives to API consumers, for instance, third-party developers, and other extensible uh, boundary resources such as buttons, Facebook Connect, uh, and uh, programmatic advertising to produce data of equivalent value to financial means. Um, permission processes, for instance, have been introduced in 2013 in version 2.0, not to protect users from data misuse by sneaky third-party apps, such as Cambridge Analytica, but to internalize the ecosystem knowledge spillovers and drive competitors out of the data economy. As the Graph API aims at capturing human experience of everyday activity, of course, questions relating to Graphical user interface design can't be neglected since the design, part, the design patterns are utilized for their apparently unique capacity to capture agency and habituate interaction. An API first design approach suggests that if by mixing a possible functionalities is not covered um, by API points and parameters, it will never be covered by any command line interface, graphical user interface button, algorithmic calculation, or voice interface. If not covered by an API endpoint, no incentives can be set or, cha or changed to foster new practice and hence original data. The boundaries of the firm would remain in stable ownership conditions. Regulation would work as expected. However, it does not. So interface critique thus constitutes another domain through which I work through the insufficiencies of the graph API di diagram by mapping out changes to Facebook's um, graphical user interface. As Thanks so much uh, for this panel and every one of your presentation. Um, what I see actually in common uh, for the four presenters um, is more around the organization of data and how and the, than the politics of or, or imaginary um, kinds of ways of dealing with, with data, right? So I think for uh, Naya, I guess um, I, I find it really interesting that like because your background is in art history, right? And then you particularly looking at the, like a more representation and the form um, uh, on historical images. But then 
but then you move on to using machine learning as a way to explore this kind of clustering. But then my question would be like this kind of individual uh, images as well as like you, you showed the snapshot of like, um, like, like a map of a lot of grouping or clustering of me images, right? So there's this kind of like um, paying attention to the detail, the objects, and as well as like, like, like the relations um, or, or this kind of high level uh, way of looking at, at images. So I'm interested uh, in the way of your thinking around this. And then uh, for Nikolai, um, I'm really interested in like, like this kind of thinking around uh, figuration and what are actually is figure, figuring, right? Uh, you sort of show three examples uh, to us. So I think my, my question would be more specifically is what forms of figuring are there and maybe for, for whom, you know? Um, and for Linda, uh, I'm also like kind of like seeing there's kind of different, um, your interest in looking into how how data has been selected and categorized and, and then, but at the same time, you're actually helping the field of computer vision to build a database, right? But then every artwork, I believe, is also very different in terms of how the artists approach um, the data or, or what are the considerations behind and your system trying to capture or optimize uh, as a standard uh, interface in a way to lock the detail, right? So I'm interested in this kind of selection process, I guess. And for uh, Tiana, it's more because uh, how I relate to to the whole group and also like the thinking around the organization of of data is I'm I'm thinking about especially your diagram diagramming practice uh, that you are showing like mapping out different API fields uh, that uh, Facebook uh, has been shown, right? But also related to what Linda um, talked about is like the gaps and the, and the doubts. So I'm just wondering um, how do you see, um, like, of course, like different diagram right, offer us a different ways of thinking around how data has been organized. But I'm just seeing whether you might have anything that you might want to say in relation to gaps and, and, and doubts. So maybe I, I start with this. Um, a lot of questions will kind of open up, and then uh, we will open up to the floors and see if you have any response that you would like to make. Should we? Okay, sure. Um, as you said, my like my entry point for this work is through art history, mm -hmm. and um, I was initially very interested in the like as I said the organizational logic of the panel itself and how it's by Babu scholar traditionally has been theorizes this compilation um, where the constant is um, similarities, like whether that be the, the content of the gestures, like the, the expression, um, or the, the forms. Um, and then, like, in today, like with uh, so many art archives being digitized and just like big data archives in general, how you can this is being scaled, this like uh, through Wendy Chan, like uh, her like uh, use of Sarah Alma's notion of homophily and how you can, you can by with, like computational anal analysis, just scale this looking at similarities on images in a much bigger content and uh, context, sorry. And I'm, I'm worried that it reinforces pattern discrimination as so many people have also like worked on. Um, so, yeah, and what I, I just, I'm not sure this answers what you, what you initially said, but um, in terms of neural networks and me using that example here, I think that specifically in terms of our book, he, he, he insisted like on the relationship, like in the entanglement of former content. And I think clustering images by way of neural networks, um, of course, we don't know what rules um, the neural networks extracts from like uh, the training data sets, but the working hypothesis is kind of that at the um, the first layers, they um, discern lower level features such as like uh, patterns and shapes, and at the the um, the last layers, uh, neural network detects start detecting like semantic image content, and I think yeah, from an art historical perspective, that that making this a very um, this cut between form and content is, is 
Um, yeah, a decent entry point for looking at these things and pro problematizing the way that we engage with clustering images on a mo much bigger scale than what art history norm is like normally concerned with. So, yeah, yeah. yeah that's would be my answer. Yeah. Okay, so in, ter in terms of the figures uh, that are evoked by, by tagging, which is uh, uh, your, your question, uh, well, in the examples that I presented, I would say probably there is this, uh, there, there, the first one is quite literal. There is this person that is a persona, and that would be the figure. Um, I mean, it speaks to different figures. It would be the Marlboro model, uh, and obviously you see the person with a cat, so already that's a bit of a challenge to the masculinity of the figure. Then there is this idea of, um, you know, also the smoke, heavy smoke coming is against kind of a, a challenge to the Instagram model, which is a very healthy, wholesome kind of figure. So, and, and in, the, in the Max Dovey's um, example, for example, the figure would be the hipster, right? And what I'm, I'm, I'm interested in is the idea that these figures are not really, you cannot really see them. And Rosie Bardotti in particular, or particularly talks about this idea that the figuration is not a figurative ways of thinking, but it's more, there is a, between her and, and, and um, Haraway, which are the two scholars that I refer to the most in terms of figures, um, they always have this kind of very elusive definition of the figure, right? It's something that's kind of defined by these gestures, but evokes something else. And in the, ex in the central chapters of my thesis, which uh, was too complicated to, to present in a five minute presentation, I talk about, for example, the figure of the gangster, right? So uh, the rapper, the gangster rapper tagging on Instagram another gangster rapper saying, you're fake, you're a snitch, that is not using hashtag gangster, but is evoking certain practices and certain values and certain, and a certain worldview by labeling somebody as a social act. But the specter of the gangster, this sort of ambiguous figure, is kind of in the background. So for me, for me, this is kind of what I, what I was, um, I'm looking for, like the, how, how tagging kind of evaporates into these figures, uh, if you will, to, and how do you in intervene in this type of imagination, which is the final part with the tagging, um, tagging tactics, tagging aesthetics. So I hope that, that answers the question. Yeah, I'm happy you ask about the, uh, about the, like kind of w what we are doing uh, with the database and, 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 and my uh, focus of interest looking at the data sets because that's really from that process the interest into data sets actually uh, merged. Uh, and we've been working on the database for, for about a year. It's been a very messy process because that's how things come to be. Um, we are trying to um, discuss postmodern and, and feminist theories uh, on the side and, 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 and think about those theories when we are building the, data <coughs> the database. It's a relational database, so in the end what we want to do with it is to, is to look at, uh, uh, to create uh, uh, network visualizations and look if some patterns emerge. So we are doing pattern, pattern recognition uh, and as Clemens was in our workshop talking, um, he said that you always have to discriminate uh, when you do pattern recognition and we had to discriminate. We had to take in, like data that we were interpreting, which is very like rich, uh, rich data and, and, and just strip it and, and this, through negotiations decide what is important uh, for us. Um, how, how do we want this data to talk to us? And um, a, a lot of people would have done it very differently. We also had challenges that we are looking at digital artworks where actually people are using the machine vision technologies, but we are also looking at narratives like uh, sci-fi novels or movies, w which have like future technologies that we can't even describe or are way more conscious um, than the technologies we have now. So, so there, there's a lot of things then that would be a, a totally own paper and presentation, so I won't, but there is a very strong connection there. Um, yeah, thank you for the question on uh, gaps and doubts and different forms of visualization, I guess. I mean, in terms of gaps and doubts, I guess, because APIs are for the biggest part, like proprietary software, I don't really have the illusion of being capable of mapping its entirety. 
Um, however, we do try, like especially when we work with um, the Internet Archive, to kind of account for those instances, for instance, by marking out parts of the graph API evolution over, year, over, like, over the years since 2007, 2006. Uh, when we know, like, our known unknown, so-called, like, when we know that we don't know what is in here because we know what is, uh, what, that it should be there, mm. for instance, that would be a way where we try to at least, like, kind of demarcate uh, and make visible where we at least know that there is information, however, we don't have it. Um, yeah, and then I guess with the visualizations, it's also that... Um, I quite like, I guess, um, Phil Agri's approach where he talks about like the observation vocabulary in, uh, as part of a critical technical practice. And I think by not reproducing kind of this metaphor of the graph as a visualization of the structure, because I'm not like um, depicting data, right? I'm trying to look at, at um, the structure behind. Um, I think it offers kind of ways to speak about the API, the, the, the connectivity, maybe the operation of the social graph in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, maybe pointing towards like internal computational operations or social operations. Um, however, maybe with different generative metaphors than maybe a network visualization would provide automatically. So that's mm -hmm. maybe, yeah part of it as well, trying to find new ways to speak about that. Thanks. Um, so are there any questions uh, from the audience? <coughs> any, any kinds of maybe comments instead of question or something that you might want to clarify? Uh, this one over there. Yeah, I, I was I was thinking actually across all the the the, the talks um, that yeah you talk about classifying, but you also talk about when when classifying becomes a language or a poetics or a, an aesthetics uh, a tactic. Uh, um, 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 maybe even software, uh, and um, and I was I was I was I was curious about you know what what should we call this or or, or how should we uh, conceptualize this language of classifying uh, you know, or classifying as an aesthetics, uh, uh, but then of course uh, uh, you have the the term figuration as as perhaps a term for this kind of. Uh, so, so maybe my question is more: you know, how 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 do you how do you feel about the term figuration? Does that cover this kind of classifying structure, uh, classifying aesthetics, classifying tactics, or do we need uh, other concepts? Um, okay, for me, for me, um, I use the term tagging because I feel like it sits quite well between the. Um, between the, um, the labeling aspect, which is, let's say, it precedes tagging as a wide, I would say, I see, let, uh, when I mentioned earlier, I see tagging as a kind of an operational form of labeling. The fact that on social media, tagging is kind of enacts some kind of material hierarchies and material relations. So there is, so to speak, pointing towards figuration. We could say that tagging is kind of a bit of a, of a stepping stone in a poetic sense. So from the label, which is definitely kind of encased within a particular structure, a particular um, system, the figuration is obviously much more elusive, much more transient, much more um, contradictory in, in a good way, perhaps, in a more inclusive way. So tagging for me is good because it captured this idea of an infrastructure, material and constraining, and this idea of the openness of the imagination and uh, the poetic kind of compulsion, I would say, even. I don't know. So for me, that's why I choose tagging as the center of my research. I don't know, but um. yeah. So we just oh, actually uh, time's up. <laughs> that's the end uh, of the panel. Uh, so uh, let's thanks for the uh, third panel. <laughs>
the last uh, panel is called, uh, and, we, and we, of course, we save the best for the last. Uh, not not to, to talk bad about all the other fantastic speakers, but <laughs> we are going to study the mundane porn meme and Billy Billy, and you'll know more about what that means in a, in a, in a, in a second. And uh, on stage we have uh, Rebecca Holt, who's a PhD candidate in film and moving image studies at Concordia University in Montreal. Uh, and for her, her dissertation, Rebecca is researching MindGeek, which is the company responsible for Pornhub and most other pop, uh, popular pornographic platforms. And we also have uh, Maximilian Schlüter, who's a PhD student in information science at uh, the Graduate School of Arts at Aarhus University uh, in, in Denmark. And his current research project is uh, concerned with memetic uh, disinformation. Uh, and uh, last but not least, we have uh, Renau uh, B. Uh, who's a PhD student in the Center for Interdisciplinary Methodologies at the uh, University of Warwick in the, in, uh, the UK, former Europe. Um, uh, his current research focuses on young people's subjectivity through digital political participation and more specifically in the Chinese context. So take it away. Okay, well thank you everyone for staying. It's very hot in here, I know. So I'm Becky, and I just want to start by saying that, so jokes about how we're all watching porn fill popular media and social anxieties. Yet media scholarship has yet to seriously consider the impact of a form of media embedded within the daily habits of most internet users across the world. So to address this, I research free online pornography and the little known corporation that has monopolized the porn industry, MindGeek. However, unlike many of the researchers before me, I don't study pornographic content. Instead, I recontextualize online porn as a cultural hub for the material and discursive conditions through which we utilize and navigate the web. I locate MindGeek alongside all of the tech companies that we associate with power. So Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, things like that. So to give you some sense of what I'm talking about, I'll briefly present two case studies orbiting my research and channel these examples through ideas about network. So the first is the Insights blog, which is a current day example. The Insights blog is a statistical press vehicle for Pornhub. Each month, the blog uses the vast data it collects from Pornhub users to make data visualizations about what and how people are watching pornography across the world. So as you can see, this is a visualization that maps the world through the most popular pornographic search terms in 2019. It has been suggested that using big data to create visualizations such as this one can result in a perverted form of network. The media scholar Wendy Chun writes, quote, correlating seemingly unrelated individual actions has revealed larger connections, but this mapping has not enabled individual subjects to understand and change the system. Instead, we use big data to ensure that people are more predictable, end quote. So this map imagines entire countries and national identities through the lens of pornography, right? So we tend to think of watching porn as an individual embodied experience, but this map takes that idea and converts it into questions of territory and population, right? So it imagines the entire population of Germany sitting in front of their computer or on their phones typing the word anal into the search bar. However, I am not really interested in the validity of German users watching anal porn. Instead, I am, interest, I am intrigued by how the mapping of pornographic search terms demonstrates the power of MindGeek to regulate people's relationship to pornography and therefore sex. Now for an older example. Bulletin board systems and edging. Computerized pornography emerged in the early 1980s with the popularization of bulletin board systems, or BBS for short. You can think about BBS as a kind of precursor to uh, messaging or online forums. 
As soon as BBS emerged, boards dedicated to pornography began popping up. Across various bulletin boards with names like sex texts and gay news, early computer enthusiasts shared pornography in two formats. Scanned pornographic photos uploaded as binary files and computer images drawn from lines of ASCII text. And that's supposed to be a gif, which is a real tragedy. What we sometimes miss in the image of the network as a graph is the experience of edges. So returning again to Wendy Chun, quote, the pulsing of energy and affect the network experience cannot be reduced to nodes and edges, for networks are about edging, end quote. So when we look at images of the network as static representations of interconnections, what we lose track of is the processual emergence of networks, links that are always in the process of forming and creating edges. Bulletin board systems demonstrate this idea of edging, both in the erotic and the technical sense. And for those that are unaware, edging refers to the sexual practice of taking yourself to the brink of climax and then stopping and doing that over and over. Bulletin board systems required money and patience. You needed a dedicated personal computer, software for BBS, an additional phone line, and software for reassembling data files into images, which took several minutes. So instead of picturing the network as a graph or image, imagine instead the computer hobbyist sitting in front of his computer screen and watching as a binary file slowly loads. As the software assembles the data, the hobbyist doesn't know what to expect. And they undoubtedly found themselves on the cusp of satisfaction, watching, waiting, and edging. So just to conclude, I am not interested in networks, the naughty version. What I'm interested in is the fact that we could not have the internet if it weren't for pornography, yet we continue to erase it from important discussions about network and power. Online pornography is anything but marginal, and it's time to begin using pornography as a powerful tool for analyzing digital culture and technology more broadly. Thank you. Hello. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Max. This is my first time I'm speaking into a microphone, so I'm a little bit excited. So. Uh, Give me a little bit of uh, slack here. I'm talking about memetic disinformation, and I'm following up Becky's uh, yeah, wonderful talk um, of interesting topics. And I think what is quite interesting about our panel in general is that if you realize we kind of went from the very big to the very small, and now we are at the kind of smallest interactions, I would say, of, of the network. And I'm looking particularly only at memes. So I'm doing a PhD in memes. And usually when I say that, people's eyes are lighting up. Uh, mostly my friends' eyes, probably, but they don't quite realize that I'm also looking at the, the darker side or the, the not so much funny side of um, of memes, right? And I'm mostly interested in the interconnection of memes and disinformation, so where they meet, but also um, how they influence each other, right? Um, and uh, what I call this for now is memetic disinformation. And I feel like the term memetic is quite interesting, so we should keep it in mind because it kind of involves a little bit more than just the singular image or image macro. It also talks more about the practice and the aesthetic, perhaps. So um, maybe let me, let me start off with why I'm actually doing this research. And I feel like now that I'm on this stage, it's quite interesting to talk about this because it stems from a deep personal fear of the geopolitical situation that we're in and the rise of far-right movements that I'm um, both getting to see and getting to know in my own networks, right, that this is uh, a meme or rather let's say a memetic content from my uncle. I mean, we could argue if this is a meme, but there's definitely some resemblance, right? We have an image macro, we have the white text on the background, we have this uh, information very condensed. Um, and my uncle is part or partaking in a way in this form of memetic disinformation in ways that make me feel quite... Um, quite uneasy. And I'm saying my uncle, but uh, it's a little bit blurry, right? It's not really my uncle, but uh, I don't want to <laughs> throw him under the bus here. Um, so that is one part of my interest. But I'm also interested in memetic disinformation because I feel like memes are a quite powerful tool. And, a quite, and when I say powerful and tool, then you might also get where I'm coming from. And there's a little bit of critical theory in there, right? So powerful and tool, as in um, I'm thinking that people might be using memes in a way to steer the discourse in a certain direction and use them persuasively, right? Because memes, um, by their very nature and appearance, and 
actually I brought some more memes here, um, are quite convincing in their way that they are um, conceiving and, uh, and delivering a message, right? They, they kind of hide their message behind humor, behind ironic, the ironic nature in a very ambivalent way and they kind of hide um, perhaps the intentions, if there was to be intentions, of groups behind their, yeah, behind their very nature. So um, one way of thinking about this, and Scott and Mackenzie Wark have uh, written a very interesting article when we look back to 2016 and the presidential elections, and maybe you guys know about the discourse about Paper the Frog, where they argue that it is at the same time ridiculous to think that a frog would influence the election, but at the same time it is not, right? There's some very real rele uh, relevance of these memes, and especially when they transcend the purely digital network, if you want to take it, and kind of move into the everyday. Um, more specifically, I'm interested in the organizational structures behind mimetic disinformation, so how this content that is very similar, right? Paying more taxes to the government will not change the weather. This is a meme I found on Reddit The Donald uh, this morning, was posted two days ago, but the narrative is quite similar to the narrative on my uncle's Facebook page, right? So how does this narrative and how does this meme uh, transcend the language and um, kind of get into my very, very personal space from, from the network that it was initially created in? Um, yes, so there is some hypothesis about power and some hypothesis about maybe we can find some centralized hub of where these memes are created. So I'm looking at that and so most specifically I'm looking at the, uh, right now I'm looking at the Donald because even though it is quite the old subreddit and if any of you know this community it has been around for around five to six years, um, I'm still, it is still very, uh, it is still going very strong in the creation of political memes. So. That is where I'm at right now, and I think that's where I would end it. And if there's any questions, feel free to ask them uh, later. Yeah. Right. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. And I'm Wan Hao. And I'll show you first uh, for you, uh, I'll first show you the, the site as a gentle taste of what I'm going to talk about because it's called like Bilibili, but I guess most of you have no idea what it is. So just get a sense of it. Although there, there won't be sound on it, but that's not a major problem. Is it on? Um, I think it's not running, but... Uh, No, it's not working. <laughs> Ref refresh it. <coughs> yep, yeah, reload. All right. Sorry for this. Yeah. Okay. It's it's working. So just get a sense about the whole site, how it looks. All right. I'll, I'll repeat for a while, so I'll just stop here. But. Yeah. Okay, um, this site is called Bilibili and it's one of the most important video sharing platform in China and featured for its commentary subtitles or Mu, which I think most of you have noticed, which is the uh, floating things. As we can see, um, the video player of this site is, is uh, the key element and basically viewers are designed to read the floating comments and watch the video at the same time. I'd argue that there is a certain political pursuit or political or orientation of openness and equality in such design. But before detailing this, I will just elaborate a little bit uh, as we can see that there are comments floating on the, on the video player, but there are spaces Four comments, yeah, they, now it's loaded. But you have to scroll down, and there are lists about the commentary subtitles, but you have to click and to make it, to, to, to see it. Okay, so the, the political pursuit, or let's say the political orientation of openness and equality in, in such design, I would say, on the one hand, it shows because of the uh, commentary subtitles are synced to any specific playback time, 
uh, they function as feedback upon, from viewers to the video uploaders. On the other hand, commentary subtitles can be used as annotations for future viewers. Moreover, due to the anonymity, uh, the content of the commentary subtitles rather than their authorship is emphasized, strengthening, the, uh, strengthening both the viewer-viewer connection and the viewer-uploader one. Yet, there is a quota for commentary subtitles according to the length of the video. Older commentary subtitles will have to give way to the newer ones when the limit is reached. Here we can see the paradoxes in Bilibili. While the anonymity of commentary subtitles may indicate openness in terms of different opinions, it can be used in a trolling manner or at least just simply pasting others' comments. While other audience uh, are brought into the viewing experience with these kind of comments, these kind of viewing experiences are in fact quite personally. And also, uh, there is a term called pseudo-synchronizing, which means that you are, you are thinking as if there are other audiences. But also, these comments are not, may, may not be read just because they, they are posted there it doesn't mean that they will be read. While all comments are, cre are, are treated rather equally, the older ones are in fact inferior to the newer ones because they will be removed at a certain point. The, the theoretical uh, reference I'm, I'm taking here is about crowds, which can be traced back to Le Bon and Todd to reveal people's psycho psychological nature in the gathering. In crowd theory, the physical co-presence co co is seen more or less as a symbol or precondition. It is also hypothesized that a status of irrationality emerges with the dense assembly of physical body. But when it comes to Billy Billy, I'd argue there is a change from the physical assembly to a status of uh, maybe pseudo a pseudo physical, quasi-physical, or non-physical massification. Uh, I'll stop here with some brief conclusions. A, there is a pseudo-synchronization that seemingly integrates the video and its commentary subtitles. B, such viewing experience is generated by a pseudo, quasi, or non-physical assemblage of the viewers who somehow have the willingness of participation Yet C, the affordance of the platform has made such participation paradoxical. It is both noise and voice, both playful and serious, both graffiti and debate. And I think all these conclusions are not limited to Bilibili and they might apply to other platforms. That's my talk, thank you. Thanks a lot for, for, for the th uh, three uh, interesting talks where we looked at some, uh, at least in, in, um, in media theory and, and, and studies, uh, overlooked platforms uh, uh, from both pornography and also uh, Chinese uh, 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 platforms uh, and looked, looked into the design and also looked into to, uh, phenomena uh, like yeah, memes, of course, and, uh, and, uh, and different uh, cultures um, of, of use. So, um, time for questions. Um, yeah, thank you all for your, your talks. I, as you were thinking, and this maybe is across the, the, the papers, but as you were, you, were, you were speaking, I was thinking of an example from about 10 or 15 years ago where uh, a critic at MIT argued that all the porn and cats and everything on the internet, right, this is Ethan Zuckerman, all, all the crap, he says, it fills up the internet in such a way that the kind of real significant activity is, is hidden away and thus can't be policed, right? So. What, what I was thinking as I'm hearing these talks is that this has actually been basically inverted, right? So what in the past was the crap blocking the real is now the real, and, and I guess we could talk about what the crap is in this model, but the, uh, 
I'm curious about what this means in each of your examples for the thing that used to be not significant and in the way and silly to become what is in fact most significantly uh, demanding our attention, right? So porn tech collecting big data, uh, fake news, right? The, the complexity of the interface for sites like Billy Billy, et cetera. I, mean, I think you get what I'm getting at. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, because I think, uh, from my point of view, I come. I think if I'd have to locate myself coming from a communications background, but also the digital media at Lafana, so it's a little bit uh, mixed up. But uh, I feel like it is exactly w what you said. Exactly what you said. The, the memes, for example, in my case, reflect the, the everyday and the mundane, and it's also what our our um, our panel was called, right? So that if if we take the theories that we had in the first panel, they must manifest somewhere, right? They must manifest somewhere in the interactions or in the, I would probably say in the interaction or in the communication acts. And by looking at, for example, the crap, looking at memes, we must find uh, some sorts of resemblance of the overall theory. At least that's what I'm, that's how I'm approaching this, right? That's why I'm looking at memes particularly. And also that, um, also, perhaps also as a provocation, even though my, now it might not be that much of a provocation anymore, but uh, as you said, when it was previously conce uh, conceived as crap, now I would say no, it isn't, right? So that's like also a provocative act, and I think, yeah, back at you. Anybody? Okay. Uh, thanks for the question, a very important thing. Um, and I, I think you have already described the, the uh, the important procedure or, or the process, it, it has already happened. Like, uh, Billy, Billy was first uh, re recognized as a place for subcultures, basically for ACG, and now it turns to be a, a rather mainstream platform, I would say. But, and so, so if, you, if you turn to some, uh, the, 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 some research in China, you are still find uh, some cases, would, some, some of them would see Billy Billy as a place for subculture. But what I see it important is, I think, mainly two points. First of all is the invitation of participa participation, as I have said, briefly covered uh, in my talk. So people can uh, show their ideas, show their in understandings by uh, leaving their comments, and the comments will float on the, on the video. So in, in this sense, you are, you are invited to, to speak out. And also, people are in, the viewers are invited to, to understand what others are, are talking about. So there is a momentum of participating. However, what the, whatever the direction it is leading to. And the other part is also uh, connected to, to this kind of massification or people gathering uh, together although it's quite digitally gathering, uh, which is also covered in my talk by, by uh, seeing to the theoretical reference of crowds. So it comes to a question like, what exactly are people doing and why are people doing so, especially given that we have way easier uh, internet access than maybe 20 or 30 years ago. So. We are doing quite a lot of things, but why are we doing this? Like, if we are doing silly things, but why are we doing so? I think this is exactly why, or the point, the significance we are focusing on this kind of mundane, uh, everyday life. Yeah, that's my answer. Thank you for that lovely question. Um, what I would say is that Pornography, online pornography now is both the crap and the real, which is precisely what makes it very important. So in the early days of online pornography, in the early days of the internet, it was really, pornography was really uh, parallel to dreams and fantasies about the internet as freedom, right? So you had these badass strippers learning how to code on the weekends and making incredible sites, and you had people innovating technologies like payment systems, building full dildo body suits that were ready for the future. It was really a kind of innovative and on the edge time, but now, because pornography is both the crap and the real, it means that it's really more about uh, the mainstream and shaping the mainstream. 
uh, which I think is, which I could go on about for a long time, but I won't. But I think that's probably how I would answer the question. Thanks. Any question there? Thank you very much for the, the presentations. I, um, what strikes me is that both uh, the three of you are working with a uh, visual content, which is uh, quite, that affect uh, most of us. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, it seems like you don't want to engage with this content visually or by looking particularly at it. So I was wondering, like, what are the methods you, will, you are going to use? Thank you. That's a great question. So there is a long history of very rich work of content analysis and pornography studies. And while I, of course, draw from it, and I'm still interested in questions of aesthetics, I'm really trying to look at the kind of structures that are beneath online pornography. So for me, I'm interested in, in researching things like corporate discourse analysis and business strategy. So finding out what kinds of patents MindGeek owns, how they represent themselves to the public. And then, of course, I'm also interested in researching technologies. So so search algorithms, big data. And then finally, I think a lot about questions of affect or how sense and sense-based experiences uh, are manifesting in online spaces. Hey, yeah, thanks for the question. I don't think I'm disregarding that per se in my talk I did. Uh, it might also be because I'm quite weak in visual cultures and that's why I'm also trying to read up on methodologies regarding that and what I'm doing in my master's thesis right now is kind of doing a rhetorical analysis of this one certain subgroup, right, that I'm seeing as a hub for mimetic disinformation. And within this rhetorical analysis, I'm also looking at the visuality, of course, of both of the image itself and then also when it's embedded in its relational context. So how it's embedded with the commentaries, for example, because also on Reddit there's a commentary function. And uh, I don't know, I, I also kind of, I tried them to bring them in here, but it's really small, so you probably can't see. But the image never stands alone, and also the meme never stands alone, right? It's always in this relational context. So I don't disregard it at all. Um, I'm just, I didn't highlight it in this way, because it's only part of it, because I'm mostly also interested in what Becky's interested in, and that's more the organizational uh, structures behind it. And that would be more uh, multifaceted ethnography, uh, multi-sided ethnography, or uh, participant interviews, participant observations, that would uh, lead that, because I'm interested in the people creating and not necessarily the visuals. Yeah, th thanks for the question. I guess I share most of the parts, but more specifically, so one of the problems, if I uh, give out an example like I just did, there is a question like, why did you pick this? Why not that one? So th there is uh, always a problem of picking what exactly the case you are looking at. And apart from that, as I have already uh, briefly covered, like the method I'm using or the, the focus I'm taking in, it's not the, the, the actual content of it, but like the, the layer, the design of the, the site, and also the, the affordance these desi designs can, can bring. So my concern here is like, we understand that these are the so-called culture uh, artifacts, but also there are the, the technology itself, the so-called technology itself, is also designed by people, are made by people. So there, is the, there, are, there are the political and cultural factors within, designed in, in or integrated in the, this kind of, whatever kind of technology. So my focus, uh, not my focus, but at least my concern is, is at least this part, which I guess most of the time we, we might be attracted by the content, by, by the visual part. But I just want to highlight that some, some part of the cultural or political factors are in fact uh, guided by these kind of technological um, settings. Yeah. Um, if nobody else, I actually have a question uh, that's uh, in a way, a continuation of a question that was brought up uh, in, in, our, in our mail list, uh, which you can fin see printed in this book, uh, uh, which related to this concept of edging that, that Becky uh, uh, talked about, um, whether, whether that could be seen as some kind of hesitation 
uh, that could even lead to some reflective moment, uh, and uh, or whether it is it is uh, uh, related to this sort of affective economy desire. Uh, um, uh, and, and since you all speak about these sort of hot topics of, of the mundane, uh, maybe you can even also uh, yeah, d discuss that also in, in relation to memes. You know, is there some kind of etching or reflection bit, you know, in the humor, perhaps in the relationship between images and text? Or, uh, or has this this um, this um, this uh, this has this space become the very political uh, instrumentalized politically uh, as you know I can be uh, ir ironical but but uh, I, I, you know I can be a racist but it, I'm only ironical uh, and I, I'm also thinking in relation to Billy Billy that this sort of layering of, of text and images including the sort of filling up the screen uh, and the, the temporality of it as some strange way of, 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 yeah, both sort of effective design, but at the same time also uh, a, 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 a multi-layered uh, 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 interface uh, that, you know, allows for um, mm, uh, uh, some kind of re reflective moment, or does it? Uh, yeah. So, 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 my question is basically: Are we seeing something, some some kind of reflective moments that you know could could be useful, uh, or is this exactly the problem that these reflective moments become you know part of the industry, part of the economy, part of the part politics uh, of of these phenomena? Do I make myself clear? No? Well. That was a really long question. <laughs> um, well, but I will answer the question about edges or edging, um, which is that it's, um, I wouldn't say that it's about hesitation, mm -hmm. precisely because it's uh, a choice to hesitate precisely because it produces pleasure. But I think edging, in both in terms of sex and the network, really is, as you said, it's meant to kind of reorient towards a, in a kind of effective economy. So it's about drawing attention to the network through relations. So instead of thinking about it as a picture, you think about it as something that is constantly occurring and that is a sense-based and embodied experience. Well, uh, very important question, but I, I won't fo focus on the, on, I won't detail the, the backgrounds of Bilibili given it's, uh, it's based in China. So, but I want to point out that there, it is the factor like the so-called online society or, or whatever uh, sites or platforms, they are um, one way or another see, seen as a, a rather public and um, yeah, public space and quite loose from the control that people might try their self, you know, taking a try because you can't catch me that quickly. So they might try something um, experimental or they try to put themselves into this kind of debate. So although it's not shown in, in, in my example, but that it is true that some, in some uh, videos people are actually discussing or debating, disagree, disagreeing with each other through and on the, the, the uh, commentary subtitles. And also they try to, they, they, they were at least trying to uh, get some kind of consensus or whatsoever. But also it is quite interesting because they will be removed at some point. So I find it like, it is like an experimental point. So people are putting themselves in it and also they realize it might not be true. So it's like both real and unreal, both serious and unserious, which is also what I've mentioned in, in, in this term. Like, and also by taking, by holding this kind of, I'm, I'm not saying it's a moral highness, but like it's the political point that I'm not doing it seriously is exactly how you can point out, put out your, your own idea. So I'm taking, I, I'm saying a joke, but it is offensive. But it is a joke, so you can't 
blame me for it. In some sense, it is like this kind of logic. I, I guess it, it might be quite the similar situation in memes, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I don't really know how to answer that question, but I, I just follow well, up. Well, we're that. also out of time, so. Oh, okay. Yeah. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thanks to the to the to the panel, uh, and uh, I'll leave the word to to Jeff. Uh, but uh, let's, uh, let's give the panel uh, a final hand and all the panels of today. Okay, the word is with me. What can we really say? You know, there's no way to really summarize the diversity of these contributions. I think it's been a fantastic way of exploring some of the, the overall ideas of the festival trying to really investigate some of the, the sort of he, well, the hegemonic idea of the network at different scales, you know, from ideas of modeling, mapping, as we've seen, through to very specific instances, which perhaps affirm the, the present in very particular ways through the uh, implementation of certain kinds of methodologies, um, not least uh, feminist and decolonial. So um, I think, um, if you have something to add to this, you'd like to add to the general discussion, please feel free to make a comment or ask a further question. Otherwise, um, I'd just like to thank you all for your attention, thank all the participants for their um, contributions, not just today, but over the last two days and over the previous two months and into the future for the next two months in terms of the development of these um, papers into longer, more academic and nuanced arguments. If you'd like an insight into some of the process, of course, we have the publication here at the front, which is an unedited digest of our conversations leading up to the workshop. You're welcome to take them. They're free, they're rough, they're raw, they're extremely interesting. Um, thank you again.